Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Whoop. I can. I can hear you very well. I'm going to say. Well, now I've, I've uh, lost. Yes. I've lost the picture. You you've lost the what? The picture. Let me. Oh no. I've got minute. you. Okay. There. Now you're back. Okay. I'm setting a timer uh, to make sure that we don't talk uh, past um, freebie Zoom. Uh, and so that's going. We've got a recording button. Do you have a recording button? Uh, I let's see. It should be showing at the top of your screen. Well, mine yes. says it's recording. Oh, good, good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, and thanks for the opportunity. Okay. Tell us um, your name that you go by uh, as you write, because I have well, three pen names. You've got three pen names. <laughs> I do. I write in three different genres. <laughs> okay. Well, I write in probably on balance four major different genres, but all under my own name. Okay. If I were to have that many extra names, I wouldn't have a clue who I was at any given time. And that's not a good thing. So if we're looking for you, we look for Pam Ebel. Pa oh, Pamela Pamela E-B-E-L. E uh -huh. Pamela E-B-E-L. Good. Right. Uh -huh. Pamela Ebel. That's how I, that's my name. And my if you're in name. four different genres, what exactly is it that you write? Do you write cozy mysteries? Do you write suspense? Well, I, I almost avoided the word genre. <laughs> because I, I see genre, and I have been doing a lot of thinking about it recently. I have sat in on several sync presentations on yeah. the question. The best that I have been able to get as a takeaway about genre is that it is simply a marketing tool. Yes, it is. Created by the publishers mm -hmm. and Amazon and booksellers who want you to be able to see thriller. And if that's what you think you want to read, you just, you have that direction and cozies are over here. So genre, as far as I'm concerned, is just a marketing tool. And therefore genre, I don't do cozies, mm -hmm. mainly because it's not something that I'm interested in. It's not that I have any real dislike for cozies. I just don't right in well, that I, genre. I'm not trying I, to write I, cozies because I have no sense of humor when I write. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and it does, cozies, go ahead. I know that cozies are, you know, supposed to be lighthearted and things, and I go very serious with some of mine. Um, I do have the occasional zinger that a character will say. They sometimes are snarky, uh, and there is occasional humor, but it's not something you can read to look forward to it. Uh, what else do you write uh, besides the, the thriller? Well, I I do thrillers. I do mainly mainstream mysteries. Ah, and so that and so that would that brings you into uh, a who done it? Yes, mm -hmm. and why? And then we wrap it up. That type of thing. Uh, sus suspense is usually where you're not really sure who did anything. Yes. Just something happened. And I do occasionally get into suspense, but mostly I'll do mainstream mystery writing. Mm -hmm. I also have recently started doing flash fiction. Ah. And most flash fiction will take no more, publishers won't take more than a thousand words. Right. So I have uh, started doing flash fiction stories, and most of those, I guess you could say, are stories of revenge. Okay. Okay. Do you write any um, historical, or are they all contemporary? No, I have a novella, which is in the, probably I'm maybe two months away from the final editing process. Uh -huh. 
Right. I have an editor. We've already been through the developmental edits. We've done the basics. That novella, Four Pieces of Evidence, is a, I guess, it's historical in that we are looking at a story based on a true crime, the murder oh. of a movie director in Hollywood in 1922 that has mm -hmm. never been solved. Right. But in my particular novella, we will solve the murder of this director. But it goes back, we start in modern day, but we have to go back into the 20s and 30s in order to dig through what actually happened that killed this person. It's also, I suppose, um, paranormal mm -hmm. because one of the protagonists is Madame Pandit and her BNB, her large monkey who wears a smoking jacket. <laughs> and um, they have been gone in real life for many, many years, but mm -hmm. they are the clue givers ah. to the two detectives who are trying mm -hmm. to solve this murder mystery. Okay. So how many series do you have? Oh, let's see. I have the Vivica Linford's Carmouche, Tales from the Crossroads. And okay. that series is about, I'm going to do something different. You mentioned that we should eventually think about the question of publishing and mm -hmm. how you go about publishing. With that series, I am about to put it up on my website, free to read. Ah. And the idea for it came from um, another friend of mine who writes mysteries, Ron Katz, K-A-T-Z. Yes, I heard and that. Ron, Hatt, he does the Silver Sleuths series, and they're all free to read. They're, they're very short. They're wonderful. And all you do is you have a cover for each of the series, each of the stories, and you simply click on that cover and the story will pop up for you to read. So the Vivica Linford series, which at the moment is seven in number, is going to go up on the website probably in September uh -huh. in, in that format. And um, I have another series called Finding Turners, which deals, see, when you get into genre, Finding Turners has to do with the activities of the retired circus performers union. And the uh -huh. circus performers are Elvira the Elephant, Poodles the Pig, uh, <laughs> so the Wolf, and all of the other attendant retired circus animals. Right. And created themselves a union in order to protect themselves from the um, animal rights groups that are not right. doing in their position, they think, a great job of protecting right. them. <laughs> and so that's, that's another series. So I have two or three short series and then what I really got into starting in 2020, probably mm -hmm. not the best of times, but <laughs> I, we made a, a, a major personal move out of a home we'd been in for 40 years. Right. Mm -hmm. To another That's home. major. Yeah. That is major, particularly trying to get rid of the stuff that you've accumulated <laughs> yes. in 40 years. And once we made the move into the Actually, it was a new old home. It was my husband's grandparents lived there and then his parents. And after his mother passed in 2018, we decided that, to buy out his brother and sister. And it's a wonderful mm -hmm. house. We just cleaned up the inside, but it was built in 1948 and it's a wonderful mm -hmm. home. Yeah. So once I got into it in 2019, I decided that... Um, I finally retired after 48 years of teaching at Tulane University. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, that was my fourth. I had four major careers, three of them going at the same time. And I thought, I need to do something. So I'll take all of these stories that I have been collecting, writing 
starting uh-huh. in 2017 when I took a creative writing class. And I would suggest uh-huh. to any of your listeners that that's not a bad idea. It, not one that you have to go and get graded. This was just a course where it was offered by the People Program in New Orleans, which is where uh-huh. I live. And the woman taught it and she, you, she gave you prompts or you didn't have to use the prompt. And we met once a week, like a semester. And I wrote a story every week. Uh-huh. And then in the summer, we didn't have it. I wrote a story every week. And so at the end of three years, I had over 150 stories. That's a nice discipline that it started you doing and, and you continued yes. with it. Exactly. So I decided to start doing something with those stories. And that's when I began to pay attention to the submissions process. Mm-hmm. Right. And particularly for short stories. And I would recommend to any of your listeners who are into, obviously, if we're in Sisters of Crime, that's part of their interest, mm-hmm. to look into joining the Short Mystery Fiction Society. It's free to join. And these individuals, there are always new people joining. Some are brand new. Others have been publishing their stories for 30, 40 years. And they are an incredible and just an incredible wealth of knowledge about crime fiction. In fact, the topic of the week this week is genre. Mm -hmm. And they have all been throwing in their two cents worth about (laughs) genre. And every week, it's last week, it was weather. Should you you know, use weather as an opener in your story, Uh those those kinds of things. Lots of skills and tools involved in these discussions. Yeah. But once I got into it, I thought I'm just going to start looking into submitting. And that's what I did. And it took me probably about six months to really begin to realize that when you hit the button and it says, here are submission guidelines, you can't take those at face value. You have to get a feel for each of the editors that Mm -hmm. you are sending your material to. And a lot of times it it requires that you look into what they have previously published, who Uh, they have previously published, the stories. uh A lot of of those uh, online and hardback anthology magazines that will do short stories or long stories and novellas, they will say, you need to read what we've been publishing. And of course, you have to pay to get the magazine or the story. That's part of the way they make their money. But even with that, you have to really listen to what they have written on that page, because Uh what what you really need to learn is when they say what they don't want. And almost every one of these submissions guidelines will say what they don't want. And you need to pay careful attention to that because something that you might've had an idea about for your story, you're not even aware to begin with that it happens to be one of those, we don't want this. Um, So so after about six months, I, I sent off two or three things in those early weeks and months and got rejected. But I was also very lucky. Most of them would write a a note that said, here's the reason why, or here's what we Ah. would have liked to have seen different. And that's when it finally hit me. I was not paying attention carefully enough to the real meaning of their Ah. Mm -hmm. guidelines and their preferences. So once I got to paying attention to that more, I moved into submitting again. And in 2020, I had five short stories submitted that were accepted. I also write poetry and I had five poems accepted and published. And then I continued to add to my list of writings, adding Mm -hmm. new stories to the ones that I already had. Right. And so when I moved into 2021, I kept going and finding, I do have a, a lot of just one, just 
just their one story and they're something maybe like you had said, they're kind of weird and wacky. Right. And I, I stumbled across the Bold Awards Anthology and Jake Devlin is, was the editor, bless his heart. Jake passed in December of this last year. I was just heartbroken. He was a wonderful mm -hmm. man, but he loved weird and wacky. And yes. in 2021, um, he took six of my stories. And then I got another 11 accepted for publication. Oh, that's a lot. And one poem. So 2021, I was busy, busy, busy. Yes. And now in 2022, so far, I have four short stories that have been accepted. Two of them are already published. The other two, one comes out next week, and I think the other one is in August. And then I've got about six at the moment out on submission. So How did you I guess find your markets. Um, did you use like, I know Writer's Digest puts out, um, um, writer's guide to the marketplace how did you find now, your markets that's why i'm suggesting short mystery fiction society because oh. they're into crime thriller suspense noir hard-boiled mm -hmm. uh their president and vice president at least once every couple of weeks there will be a market call listing oh. from them mm -hmm. and you click on that and it will have um, submissions, and I think one of the major ones is called submissions and other forms of lunacy, something like that. <laughs> you go online and you look at that, and they do it. That particular online market is for each month. Ah, and so uh -huh. here are the calls for June and then July, and wow. it will have the name of the magazine or the anthology or the public publisher uh -huh. and then it's got a link and you it'll say here's their deadline and if it looks of interest you just simply click on the link and you'll pull up right. the new group in fact one of the things they did about three weeks ago was they posted a literary journals calls and I when I first started out most of everything I wrote was what there again, genre, but literary. I love language. Uh, I, I have learned to do the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am thing for what? flash and, you know, yeah. and, and, ha and how to um, show and not tell. But I happen to like being able to tell sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw that call for literary journals, I was so thrilled. And there are probably in that listing, maybe 30 of them. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are paying markets. Wow. And, but, but they're all over the board in what they're interested in. And I had, in fact, before I clicked on to join you in conversation, I have four that I was making sure I had the correct deadlines for July. Wow. Mm -hmm. that I have stories that either I have written, I need to clean up, or I'm about to write and submit right. those. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. What was it that you taught at Tulane University? Oh, well, at Tulane, uh, I taught, well, I have a bachelor's and a master's in rhetoric and public address. Mm -hmm. And that's probably one of the things that has helped me most in my writing, because to learn how to put together speeches Right. It's the same thing as writing. Tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. And then and tell so it in I, a memorable way. Yes. Uh, I taught yeah. um, public speaking, beginning and advanced. I taught debate, small group mm -hmm. problem solving discussions, mm -hmm. oral interpretation of literature, and then moving into a later stage before, just before retirement, they started a, a public policy master's program for people in the phys ed area that wanted to uh -huh. get into working with various hospitals in these rehabilitation right. programs. Uh -huh. I also have a law degree and I worked, taught at Tulane or at Loyola where I got my law degree. I was an associate dean over there for 15 years. Uh -huh. So I used the legal background whenever possible when it fits right. to do 
either side, other side work or work it into my stories. Mm -hmm. Good. That, all that sounds very interesting. I wish I had been there to take some of your classes. Well, I wish you had too. We always had a good time. In fact, I do miss, I miss the students. Um, yes. I miss that, that give and take. I truly miss that. I had 30 years in the high school and college classroom and it's the okay. students I miss. Um, okay. I, I truly, truly miss that. Uh, their energy kept me going mm -hmm. sometimes. Uh, yeah. I'm sure they didn't like my essays that I made them write. <laughs> well, in the end, I bet you they are thanking you wherever they are doing whatever they're doing. Well, I still think of them some, sometimes and, and think, and I wonder what they're doing. And I'm hoping they're using some of the things. Um, besides the short stories that are going to be on your website, do you have like links to anthologies that you are in or, or other things that you put up regularly so that people can find your work? I need to do that. The website in order to do these series that I want to put up, we mm -hmm. are, I have this wonderful young woman. She is a member of Sisters New Orleans. And Marissa is just a whiz. She's designed all of my book covers for me. Mm -hmm. And she is just wonderful when it comes to computer situations, yeah. technical opportunities that I mm -hmm. just don't understand. So we're in the process of rebuilding the website in order to have, have all of these things. Mm -hmm. I do have a Facebook page and on the Facebook page, on my stream, I, I'm, I'm not fond of social media. I'm just not, I, I think it wastes a tremendous amount of time. Yeah. I mean, I look at some people and I think, if you were spending as much time writing as you are writing on this Facebook page, yes, it'd be, yes. you know, <laughs> it'd be a lot bigger and better, but everybody does things differently. Uh, but on my, I, about once every two months, I mm -hmm. put out a sm small newsletter wow. on that Facebook page. And we talk, I tell them who I've been working with and what I've been up to and then personal things as well. Mm -hmm. And I always link the short stories. Like right. the next one coming out next week is going to be in a, a online magazine called Yellow Mama. And that particular story, Dead Men Don't Text, is <laughs> will be out. And when when it goes out, she will put it uh, she gives me the link and then I wow. simply transfer the link into my Facebook page and say, here it is, folks, and click wow. on it. And, and so most of the stories that I have been publishing are on that Facebook page wow. as they came out. Mm -hmm. But I am going, like, I'm glad you asked the question about the situation with the website because it does need work in order to accommodate all of these new ideas that I come up with, and then it's her problem to figure out how to do it. <laughs> uh, it can be intimidating to work on them because when I, when I get into my website and it's a very cluttered website, but when I get into it, it, it I can spend the whole day, I can spend all of a Saturday working on it. And I feel like I have done nothing and it still looks the way that it looked before. And it just drives me insane. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that might be another point that everybody needs to consider. And that is how much money yes. do you choose to invest in your work and in your profession as a writer? Right. And I know we tend not to talk, people don't like to talk about money, but I think that it's crucial that before you do anything else, once mm -hmm. you decide you want to give this a shot, or however you want to publish, that you take a serious look at your own circumstances. What can I right. afford? That kind of thing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Because I think some people get in and they think, I'm going to write a book. And it's going to sell tons of money. And they don't think about um, that they 
you know, if they want to do it self-publishing, they don't think about the cost of the cover, you know, and, and how to learn to do a cover themselves and that kind of thing. And so there's, and then have their own website. You have to pay the website fees and all sorts of things. Um, so that, that's really hard. Um, when you started writing, did you make any newbie writer mistakes that you want to warn people away from making? Well, the one thing, I think what most writers do, unless they have been on a trajectory one way or the other, I think everybody thinks that what they are going to do to be considered a writer mm -hmm. is they have to write a novel. Ah. Mm -hmm. I think most people, not everybody, but most people start with, I'm going to write a novel, I'm going to write a mm -hmm. novel. That's how I'll be considered a writer. And novels, as you know, are a huge undertaking. They are the most expensive type of writing that you're going to get into, uh -huh. whether it's, whether you go through the brick and mortar and what, there are only three left, they keep right. gobbling each other up. Uh -huh. And unlike the old days, you rarely get a decent advance if you get one at all. They expect you to do your own editing processes and right. helping to put your book cover, all of those things that they used to do for you falls to the writer now. Right. Mm -hmm. So novels are a big undertaking and there's something like 400, 500,000 that roll through um, each, every six months or so through the traditional publishers. So you mm -hmm. have to think about all of those people writing novels like you did. Mm -hmm. So maybe, I mean, I have a novel that I, when I first decided I was going to do this, I was still working full time, both at the law school and at Tulane. But I started this novel. And uh, again, it, it's based on a true experience. Mm -hmm. I finished it, I think I started it in 2000 and maybe 1998 or nine. And I had it wrapped up by 2004, my first, it would mm -hmm. have to go through all sorts of editing processes. Mm -hmm. And and then in 2005, Katrina hit New Orleans. Yes. Yeah. And we were out of house and pocket for about three and a half months, mm -hmm. which put everything on hold, including yeah. working on anything. But the real problem for me was once I got back into the story, the New Orleans, where my story started, wasn't there anymore. Right. Yeah. It wasn't distant. So I, ha I, I couldn't leave it like it was. I had mm -hmm. to go back and start fixing everything where things had been and weren't anymore. Right. And yeah. that was a long process, but I finally got it back again to where I should be, should be able to clean it up myself and start shipping it off for editing. And I pitched that book to five, five or six different editors at two different conferences that I attended. Everybody wanted to see parts of that book and Tom Calvin at Penguin said, you finish that, you clean it up, you send me the best copy you can. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, life continued to intrude. Right. And so that novel still sits, it's at a, about 180,000 words. Mm -hmm. That's a massive a book. Yeah. Yes. And it needs, well, it, it goes all over the place, uh, which is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's sitting there and eventually I'll get back to it. But I heard an excellent speech and it made me think when someone said, if you have a novel that 
hasn't gone anywhere, mm -hmm. then one of the things you might want to do is go through that novel and read it carefully. And the person said, I'll bet you will find a short story. Uh, and by short, we're looking, you know, that they'll take short stories of up to seven, 8,000 words. Right. I'll bet you'll find a short story waiting to be told. And this particular person did just that and just won um, a Derringer Award for that wow. short story mm -hmm. that she pulled out of that novel languishing in her drawer. But I think that's, that's what we all start with. We're going to make novels. And if you really get into it and you're lucky enough either to get selected mm -hmm. to go with a traditional publisher or a hybrid publisher and you you get going with your novels if you think I'm going to do a series mm -hmm. then some people that's what they like to do and they they just crank them out um but and that was my mistake I, I could well have been doing other things as well as the novel. I mean, mm -hmm. I can still go back to the novel, but right. in the meantime, for me, my problem is I get bored <laughs> very quickly. Yeah, yeah. And so I need to I need to have constant challenges in different types of storylines. Right. And that keeps me fresh and allows me to. It's like the Vivica Linford's Carmouche series. She's all over the United States uh -huh. doing stories, writing short books about very odd circumstances. The mm -hmm. rattlesnake roundup in Texas and meeting the three wives of Wyatt Earp uh -huh. and um, riding with the wild hogs in Florida wow. and the Shucking good time in Alabama at the annual oyster festival. I mean, she's all over the place. Right. And I get all of those stories out of the newspaper. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so she so just found the story and you just you right. write it in the situation. She just me. moves around the country as the stories uh, come out. And so, that piques your curiosity and your development of the story, keeps you intrigued with it. Yes. So that she never gets tiresome to me mm -hmm. because there's something new and different. And I, the stories that I pick for her and the Finding Turner series with the, um, the Circus Animals Union, we have a group of, of people, Turners, men and women who work with this group, but they, they uh, are training dogs right now right. to work mm -hmm. with servicemen. And then yeah. they decided that there was no reason why they couldn't train horses. And so right. they've got a whole set of horse activities mm -hmm. going on. And yeah. then they're trying to keep the circus alive for people to see a real circus. Right. So there are all these different things that are going on in all of these various series. And they're very different. And when I get to the point where I want to change and Put that one aside I move on to another one or I create something completely new right mm -hmm. is there any writing tool that you use some people have talked about spreadsheets some people have talked about using Scrivener is there any tool that you particularly use that you cannot live without as you're writing ah <laughs> I, I write, I sketch things out on paper before I move to the I computer. start every story on a yellow legal pad. I yes. start writing by hand mm -hmm. because that's how I was educated and trained in yes. all of my various professional lives. Mm -hmm. So I start out with that. And once I've got, and I, I'm not talking outlining, I'm talking the story. I start yes. and I'll have probably the first couple of pages written enough that I can then type it and yeah. move on quickly from there. Right. And other than that, no, I, I don't use any kinds of tools. Mm -hmm. I, I use Word to create my documents. I, do too. I have um, a calendar. <laughs> my planner. 
I cannot live and without my I, I know everybody else or a lot of people, they have all these tools on the computer. If that can, after Katrina, yeah. we didn't have power. Yeah. Ida, last year, we have a Generac. So the house, thank God, we just had gotten it put in the mm -hmm. day that the storm came through. We were without power for 11 days. Wow. We had plenty of power in the house, but you do not have internet connection unless you have phone lines and the mm -hmm. phone lines were down. So wow. I still didn't have the computer, mm -hmm. you know, so I, I believe in paper. Yes, I, do I too. just don't. And, and, I, even and I, would, the... I would go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think one of the things that probably when you share these ideas, a lot of this has to do with the other thing we haven't talked specifically about, and that's the age differentiation. Yes. Mm -hmm. When you reach, I mean, I just turned 75. So I have been through four careers. This is yes. the career number five for me. I do approach it like a career, which right. is why I mentioned the concept of money. How much mm -hmm. are you wanting to spend mm -hmm. and put into this effort? Also, how much time you want to invest depending upon where in your writing journey you actually are. Right. Mm -hmm. Those of us who are decades into our work, mm -hmm. frequently, unless you already have started with a traditional publisher, you know, these, these writers like um, any number I can think of, I, I was just reading another one of the Eve Duncan mm -hmm. series, that's Iris Johansson. Um, the, she's got 12 or 13. And Nora Roberts with her J.D. Robb. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even though they're moving up in age, they, have, they made those choices a long time ago. But wow. if you're relatively new to the process, you have to ask yourself, how much time do you want to spend waiting for other people to validate your work. Waiting, waiting. Waiting and waiting for Godot, who never comes. Right. So <laughs> that's, to me, that's one of the questions. And obviously for me, I, I'm not waiting for uh -huh. people. And with my other professional backgrounds, I'm just, I'm not prepared to have to sit down and talk with an editor um, or an agent. Mm -hmm. I notice that when I go to these conferences, they're 30 if they're wow. a day. <laughs> and there's that's a 40 some year time span. There's wow. there's just a complete difference in where we're coming from. Right. Wow. But for younger writers, you need to still ask that question: how long are you willing? to wait for the validation of an, getting an agent. Mm -hmm. In our sister's chapter in New Orleans, I have four different um, members, friends of mine, and they have all had series of books. Right. Two of them got agents early on and had small press publishers. Then the agents, oh. I'm not sure, but they went away and maybe even the publishing houses. And so they they went into the self-publishing, you put it together and then you put it wow. up on Amazon. But all of a sudden, two of them had decided, well, we just, we need an agent. And I wanted so badly to say, why? Why, <laughs> why, do, you, why do you want to subject yourself to that again? Wow. Mm -hmm. Except they, their statement is, well, we want to make a living at this. And as you've wow. noted, and if anybody's read that sister's audit they just did, that uh -huh. survey of how little money most writers make. Yes, yes, exactly. We are within seconds of running out of time. And I want to thank okay. you so much, Pam. Uh, thank you so very, very much. You have said so many wonderful things today, things that we need to hear. Um, and I love how you talked about talking, starting with short fiction. I'm, I've taken that on as my challenge this year, short fiction. So I hope I will do as well as you have. Uh, yeah, give it a shot, everybody.